Good afternoon. Welcome to Finding Happiness in Hard Times. My name is Ken Burtness, and I'm coming to you from Aliiva out at the North Shore. And today we have a joyful talk, topic to talk about. Uh, children's books and families reading together. And to do that, uh, I've invited and have my good friend, Holly Braffitt, with us, who is the children's librarian out at the Wailua Public Library. Welcome to the show, Holly. Hi, Ken. Thanks for inviting me on today. I'm always happy to talk about books and the love of reading with other book lovers. It's a really exciting thing to talk about. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that we really stress on this show about finding happiness is being sure that you're happy in your job. And uh, Holly, your job to me is, uh, I can't think of a happier one right offhand, than reading books and reading children's books. Uh, certainly was a turning point in my life to be able to be able to read and to have the world of books open up to me. So, uh, and here that happened to you, and, uh, and then you had, were able to turn around and help other children do that as well. So maybe that's a good place to start at the beginning. What, How was it for you when you were young and growing up, and how did you get turned on to books? And then later, as an adult, how did you get turned on to turning kids on to books and reading? Well, um, like you, I was an only child, and when I was little, my mom, my mom was very young, and she started reading to me from infancy, and by the time I was three, I could already read along with her. Um, it, it never occurred to me that this was a thing that not everybody did. She read to me every night. We started with um, Where the Wild Things Are and In the Night Kitchen, and then when I was five and six, we read The Hobbit and Little House on the Prairie, and I grew up with books. Um, my grandmother was also a librarian, so our family always had books in the house, and I just kind of sort of took it for granted. Um, as I got older, I, I became more interested in art, and I went to art school. Um, I had a difficult time after art school landing a job, and I, I had a moment where I was speaking to my mother, who is now a teacher, and I said, I should have been a librarian like grandma, and she's like, why don't we both be librarians? And so we both went to grad school, and we both got our library degrees, and now she's um, school librarian out in Kaaava, and I became um, the children's librarian. It just, her reading to me as a child naturally flowed into me reading to children in the library. I had her example um, on how to do the voices and how to show, you know, di read dynamically. Um, and then her, all of the songs that I learned from her while she was a, a kindergarten to third grade teacher. Uh, it all fit very neatly into it, and I was able to share that with um, the children in the schools and communities that I, I worked in. One of the things that uh, Holly and I were talking about is uh, she's not only a librarian, but she's also a writer of children's books, an illustrator of children's books, and a storyteller. Um, so you cover all the bases there. I was wondering, uh, you know, what really came first? Did you start writing books first or did you, uh, was it beginning with uh, children first in the library, reading to them books and then you writing the books or the other way around? How did that go? It started in art school. Uh, I was actually studying computer animation and I had big dreams about working for big animation companies, but I started taking illustration courses as electives and I discovered that that was what I really enjoyed doing. And my mother being a storyteller and a teacher, I asked her one semester to send me a story and I would try illustrating it as a project. And um, she sent me what would become the, our first book, which was No Slippers. And I illustrated that during my last year of university. And then um, when I moved back to Hawaii after college, I pitched it to my editor and uh, she picked it up right away. And since then, I've been doing about one book a year. Um, I've only written one of them. I wrote a potty book for my daughter. And I, uh, that, was, that was a learning experience. <laughs> As a librarian, I have always wondered why there were not more potty books, because there's a very high need for them. But I've discovered how awkward it, it is doing research for those books. And I can see where a lot of people be very shy about actually illustrating them. Um, but it turned out to be the most popular book of all the ones that I've done. 
again, there's a big need. Parents need that support at home. Um, so right now I'm working on two books. Um, it's always just been a side thing that I've done in addition to being a librarian. Um, and we do book signings down at Barnes & Noble, and sometimes I read my books at um, book events around the island. So I love being able to give back to the community, and it's so important for children to find themselves represented in books. And, you know, we need more books of our, about our local communities and our local kids. That's important to Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things that I love, uh, and I spend a lot of time at the Wailua Library, one of my favorite times is going in on Saturday mornings around 10 o'clock, and that's storytelling time. So I tiptoe in, and I see Holly with all these kids around her, just hanging on her every word as she introduces these wonderful books to the kids. Um, it is just a joyful uh, experience just watching. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into storytelling time and uh, and the joy that you get and the kids get out of that. And how, how does that work? Why is it so popular? Oh, goodness. Story time is the most important thing that I do as a librarian. And it's the scariest. I was so nervous the first time I had to go up in front of a group of kids and you've got to sing songs and do the little rhymes with them and the parents are all staring at you. And it took a long time to get comfortable, but you just got to fake it and go in there with a good attitude. And if you're having fun, the kids will have fun. So I always pick books that I like. I've got to read them to myself first. And if I find them delightful, the kids will usually find them delightful. And if I mess them up, if you're reading to a group of kids and you say the words all backwards and you just laugh about it, the kids will all laugh too. And they're all having a good time. One of the most important things about story time, besides the fact that the children become lifelong readers and lifelong learners, if you read to them, you're also reading to the parents and showing them that it's okay to be silly. It's okay to make the noises and the quacking and the mooing. And if you sing the songs out of key, it doesn't matter. The kids just want you to read to them, tell them stories, sing with them, and they don't care what your voice sounds like. They just want to, to have that connection with you. With the little kids, we do a lot of shaky eggs and scarf songs during story time to keep them uh, active because they can sit through a story, but they really got to move their little bodies after the, each story. So if we can get them up, we do a little rhyme, we can jump up and down and sit back down. Everybody get your hands in your lap and then we'll read the next book. Um, it's a great time. And as the rowdier kids get used to it, you see week to week, they start figuring out what the other kids are doing and what's expected of them in the library and how to, you know, work in a group with other kids. And they make friends with the other kids and the moms all make connections. It's a really beautiful thing and it's so important. And it's really one of the most rewarding parts of my job, even though every week, even 17 years into it, I still get nervous when I sit down in front of all of those kids. But then afterwards, it's, it's you get this little thrill and you're like, oh, that was great. Or if it was chaos, you're like, oh my gosh, that was out of control. But it's always fun. Um, and that's just the little kids. During the summer, I do story time with the older children in the summer fun programs. Um, so all the kids that are stuck in daycare all day long, we have them come up twice a week during the summer. And we do a special story times just with the older kids. And the older kids like a totally different set of books than the little guys. They want scary stories. They want ghost stories, and they want true stories. So the books that I can read to the older kids, especially, you know, since their parents all aren't all there staring at me, I can get spooky and tell them the scary things and do little jump scares at them, and um, we can make a lot of noise in the library. We do these clapping songs and call-and-response songs, and the whole library is shaking, and I, I apologize to the patrons later afterwards. Thank you for your I know that was really loud, but the kids are so excited to make a lot of noise in the library. It um, makes them come back over and over again, and it, it really makes me happy to see my little guys that I had in toddler time, which was pre-pandemic. We haven't been able to bring toddler time back yet, but I'm, I'm gonna. And then the weekly story times for the, you know, the preschool and slightly older kids. Um, we lose them after that. They stop coming right around third, fourth grade. They've got better things to do. 
They've got their own books at the school library. They don't want to come to story time anymore. And we lose them until about, you know, sixth grade. And then they start coming to me in the summer fun program. And they remember why they loved being in the library when they were little. When we start seeing them come in again more on their own after school. And that makes me so happy. Um, I had, I was thinking about things that bring me joy, you know, when we were talking about this subject. And before the pandemic, um, years ago, I started telling scary true stories that had happened to me, ghost stories. And, you know, I didn't think much about it. But the other day, like last week, I turned around and there was a teenager standing there. And she said, do you remember me? I was like, I do. I, I'm so sorry I don't remember your name, but I remember you. Yes. And she says, well, yeah, about five, six years ago, I was in Summer Fun and I came up and you told a spooky story. And I told my friend, she introduces her friend who's standing there awkwardly. And I wanted you to tell her the story. Um, I love the story so much that I told, I wrote my own version of it for a class assignment. And I wanted her to hear the original. And I was so surprised. I put down what I was doing and I told the story right on the spot. And the kids, you know, gave little shivers and they said thanks and they ran away. And I just like that realization that that one story that I told years ago to this group of kids, it something struck one of them, you know, and she's been thinking about it and she's making it her own and um, she's bringing her friend to the library. It was just so wonderful. And that's that kind of thing that story time allows us to do to connect with these kids. And it's so rewarding. Wow. Well, that brings back, uh, back memories because uh, I worked with kids too. Um, when I first came to Hawaii, I was into amateur theater and did a number of productions in Hawaii for the first uh, 10, 15 years. But then I got a job uh, with Schofield uh, helping out with uh, drug and alcohol therapy and, uh, and prevention. And the community came to the Army where I was working at Schofield Barracks and said, and he had one of their people come out, one of your people come out and talk to kids about substance abuse. So they don't do substance abuse. And so they turned to me and uh, it took one time out to the schools realizing that uh, these kids are not going to listen to adults, especially (laughs) old adults. So I started a puppetry program. And uh, for the next 15 years in central Oahu, where I was, where my focus is, uh, we took puppetry programs out to uh, the schools, the elementary schools. And we did them in the library, uh, the, actually the Capitorium is what it was. It was sort of double. Um, and so uh, we did two shows. We did a show for K through two, K through two or three, uh, depending upon the school. And uh, then we did a show for four through six. And I found exactly what you found, you know, kids, older kids need different stories. So I would come in and we would produce two puppet shows, totally different, uh, for the K through uh, the K through three and so the four through six, uh, and that way a child who came came into one of these shows at one of the elementary schools, like say Sunset Beach Elementary up where I live, they would never see the same show. They would see a show, a different show, because I had four shows for K through three, and then three shows for four through six. So I had seven shows. They would always see a different show. And it was, and I ran into the same thing you did. The older kids needed a different type of story. They needed a different type of message. They needed things that were going to make them laugh and, uh, and be surprised at. Uh, but in both cases, it was just a wonderful thing working with kids. And, uh, and your storytelling time certainly does that. And uh, it's just incredible. And I know the feeling when, somebody comes up to you after a long period of time and say that they remembered, you know, way back when it's like, uh, it's like thunderous applause that you're getting from the individual kid. And, uh, it's a, it's a glorious thing. Let's, uh, let's move on to families. Uh, one of the things that happened during uh, COVID, uh, was we became sort of disconnected and with lockdown and everything, uh, Difficult time was even more difficult. And uh, 
there was less togetherness between parents and kids. Uh, of course, we were in a time where uh, when the parents were working, they usually it was both parents in need for money. And so uh, things like uh, story time, you know, uh, with parents and kids and uh, dinner time together. And, and a lot of things just sort of disappeared. And, and kids wound up being looking at their, uh, you know, iPhones and the parents had all their work to do. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how uh, you're able to encourage parents and kids to uh, to set aside a time to come together, even if they haven't been together officially, you know, at a certain, you know, projected time. But uh, how can we get them back together and operating and enjoying each other, parents through children? Oh, yeah. The, the pandemic was such a shock and, and really readjusted how everybody was living. At the library, we had to switch to virtual story times and I would I did recordings and we put them out on face on on YouTube. Um but it wasn't it definitely doesn't have the same reach as, as an in person program. Uh one of the things we offered and once word caught of this it was like wildfire. I was willing to put together just piles of books for people. So once I told one parent, she told another, somebody posted on Facebook, they said, if you call the library and tell them how old your kid is, how many kids you have, they'll just put together a stack of books and then they'll bring them to the door for you. So all day long, we would get the phone ringing off the hook for people who wanted 30, 40, 50 books. So people were still reading with their children during that time. And that was it was so much fun. It felt like a treasure hunt, you know, running around the library and um, picking out all of my favorite books and making giant stacks. Well, this kid only likes, like, he really likes trucks and dinosaurs and cats. So we're going to get a whole lot of books on that. And some of the families I knew, oh, they came last week. I got to get different books. And the wild selection I would put together, the parents said it was, it was great. There were things in there they would have never necessarily picked on their own. And to have that uh, service really help them keep in touch with their child and keep reading with them every night. And now, as we're getting back into the swing of things again, um, I would really encourage parents, put that time aside every night, right before bedtime, like um, plan for about half an hour, 45 minutes into an hour if you can. It's, I know it's hard to read for that long sometimes, but if you get into the routine, your child will be so happy and expect it every night and just keep reading to them way longer than you think you should like um, some parents they kind of have this idea that they're reading to their child until their child can read and then the child can read on their own and that's true you know make sure your child has books that they really love reading on their own um, but keep reading at night read to them till you know when they're 10 read them harry potter when they're 12 read them the hobbit when they're 13 and 14, if they'll still put up with you, read Lord of the Rings with them. You can, you know, the books can get more challenging and more interesting to you as a parent as they get older. And it'll really give you that time that they're going to remember for the rest of their lives. And they'll read to their children and they will continue to read on their own independently as adults. And that's the real goal. We want to have lifelong readers who think of books as friends and, you know, a, a thing that they can do to feel happier in their own lives. Um, don't be afraid to make the noises, do all the voices, and you don't have to do them well. This is what I was saying. You don't have to be an actor. You just have to read with enthusiasm, um, read with love, and uh, enjoy yourself. Pick books that you like to read and just keep at it with your child. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, when you were talking about that uh, earlier, about that gap, let's... I'd like to go back to the gap because that, I think, uh, talks to what you're talking about now. Uh, you know, when they're third or fourth grade and you sort of lose them for a while until they come back to the summer fun program later on. Um, one of the things that I always tried to encourage was uh, because, you know, like Holly, I'm an only child. And so not having siblings, but uh, knowing a lot of my friends that had siblings, one of the things I did to encourage especially when my friends had their kids, was to have their kids, once they sort of stopped listening to their parents read, have the kids read to their parents and keep it the family time. Uh, and uh, it's joyful for the parents because 
their lessons that they've passed on, the joy of books and how to read, comes back to them and keeps them together for that, you know, whatever amount of time that you've set aside for that. And uh, I find that that is really helpful when uh, you can have the older kids turn around and read to the younger kids. Or if you're only children, uh, turn around and read to the adults, like I'm saying, and the adults will love it because they'll see the fruits of their labors sort of, uh, you know, and come. And uh, and that's one of the things that uh, I really emphasize is bringing families together. And I think books are such a wonderful way to bring every member of the family together and uh, bring them closer and have things to share, not only in the moment, but memories to share, like you're talking about with your with your parents. Yeah. Um, I hadn't really thought about kids reading to other kids or kids reading to their parents too much since my point of view had always been, you know, reading to the kids. I have three children myself and um, as an only child, you know, I didn't have any little siblings to read to and my mother worked a lot. So I read to myself mostly. So it just never occurred to me that, to, to ask them to do that. Um, but I think so long as you're not making it a chore, you have to go read to your little brother or sister. Absolutely. You have to sit and read to me for an hour now. You know, that's going to make them anxious and unhappy and really self-conscious about getting words wrong. But, of course, you know, if you read to your child with love and enthusiasm, they will naturally model that behavior. And you'll turn around in the car and find that they're reading to their little brother or sister in the back seat. And you didn't even have to ask them to. If they want to read to you, try to make time for that and say, yeah, let's hear it, you know, and try not to put away whatever it is that you're working on if you can and give them that chance to have that time with you. So long as it's a pleasure and the chat, you know, that it's not being seen as a chore and work and something they have to do or they're going to get in trouble. Um, absolutely. The whole family should read together as much as they enjoy, you know. That, that's a great point about the, the chore thing, you know, I mean, because, you know, even the most innocuous chore becomes a real pain in the okoli when, yeah. when the kid is thinking, oh, I got to do this, you know, and then if I don't, they're going to yell at me or I'm going to do it wrong. And, and that's perfect. Yeah, we have a lot of parents that come to the library that want something challenging for their child. And I'm like, is this is this for fun? Is this summer you know, <laughs> reading or fall break reading? Well, they need to challenge themselves. How they don't. <laughs> if they are reading books they love, even if they're comic books, Captain Underpants, Dogman, if you even if you think it's silly what they're reading, if they are sitting there reading a book and they're absorbed in it, you are winning. That child <laughs> needs to read and they will keep reading. And when that's too easy for them, they will naturally progress to the next thing. They'll only read things that they're that are at the right level for them. So be patient. Be supportive. I love that you're reading. It's so great. And bring them to the library. <laughs> well said. Thank you for that, Holly. Holly, we're sort of coming to the end of the show. And one of the things that I usually ask people, and I will ask you, uh, relates to the catastrophes that everybody's been going through in the world, including us here in Hawaii with the Maui wildfires, of course. Um, and I've asked Holly to sort of Tell us a little bit about a couple books that she has that she might recommend to uh, to families that have gone through some really, really difficult times and not had a chance to be together or have lost some some members or have lost, uh, you know, grievous losses like Holmes and, you know, and that. Um, two books that might inspire hope. And uh, Holly's brought them along. And let me turn it back to Holly to share those with you. That was, it was a great thing to think about because when children go through traumatic events, they might not actually want to talk about it and definitely they don't want to read about it. So it depends on the situation. We do have books that deal with divorce and grief. And, you know, if your child is ready to talk about it, we have books to help. But for a lot of times, um, a work of fiction will help a child kind of get their head around those issues in a way. Um, when they see the character dealing with it and, and the, the situation unfolding, they can relate to it and say, yeah, you know, and they'll internalize that. 
So you don't have to hit them over the head with a book, you know, about grief, but you can read them a gentle story that will help them process it. So one of my favorite ones that I've read recently was The Beatrice Prophecy, and this is by Kate DeCamelo. Uh, she wrote The Tale of Despero, and her writing is beautiful. Um, the vocabulary is excellent, so it's a great read-aloud story for your child. Um, this is the story of a little girl who has a terrible thing happen to her, but she can't remember what it was. She wakes up one morning with a terrible fever. She can't remember what happened, and she's clutching the ears of a very mean goat. She doesn't know the goat is a, is a mean goat, but there, she has made her way to the um, the monks at uh, the Chronicles of Sorrowing, and there's this monk named Brother Edic who has a wandering eye, and he finds um, this child with this goat that everybody is afraid of named M Answelica. And he realizes immediately that there's something very special about this little girl. Um, and it doesn't take long to figure out that one of the things that is special about her, she can read. And this is a time when it is forbidden for anyone to know how to read except for the royalty and for the monks who are tasked with writing down the chronicles. Uh, he realizes he needs to protect this child. And as Beatrice starts to slowly remember who she is, and the terrible things that happened to her. She she dives into a story. She she spills it out onto paper and she writes this story to help herself process what happened to her. And when she realizes who she was, she decides she's going to retake her kingdom and she's going to find her mother and she's gonna put things right. And it's it's a very inspirational story. It has a lot of hope in it, even though all these terrible things happen to this little girl and she's running from something really awful. She's going to make it right. She's going to take a stand and she's going to go face the king. Um, it's a wonderful story. I absolutely recommend it to anyone that's dealing with uh, difficult subjects with their kid. Um, second story is The Skull, and this one is much lighter story. <laughs> it, it's a dark and spooky ghost story for children who are feeling a little dark and spooky. Um, but it's, again, a child who is running from something, and she has to face it and solve it and triumph. It's a wonderful story. Oh, terrific. And it's, it sounds like a great Halloween story, which is coming up right on us. <laughs> so that's great. Um, and we're out of time. So... Uh, Holly, let me thank you so much for coming and sharing your thoughts and ideas and uh, your love of books uh, and to love of working with children. Really appreciate it. Well, I thank you, Ken. Thanks for having me. It was a delight. Thanks. And thanks to all the people who were tuned in. As always, we appreciate you being out there in the audience. We appreciate all the people at Think Tech Hawaii, including uh, Jay and Michael and Carol, uh, just and Haley, of course. Uh, we really appreciate all your help and support. And in two weeks, we hope you'll return because we've got a joyful and magical uh, story about old cars and uh, the love of vintage cars and classic cars. And that should be a lot of fun if you're into automobiles. And even if you're not, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Thank you all for tuning in and aloha. <laughs>